Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should be aware that this series may contain images, voices or names of deceased persons. This episode, Captivity Narratives, is part of the series that deals with people. It examines the origins of white Australia in the founding of a convict colony. We ask if this new land was a prison or a paradise. We travel to the places convicts were first sent to, Hobart and Sydney, and we end and begin our journey in Canberra. The object we're focusing on today is the smallest we'll consider in this series. It sits here in the palm of my hand, a tiny coin, worn down with age. It's so old I'm wearing these gloves to protect it, and it's so tiny that it was really rather lost in that impressive display case. It's the tiniest object, but it's also the most intimate. Centuries ago, Thomas Alsop scratched this parting message to his mother on the eve of transportation to New South Wales. And as we turn that coin over, we see just how tender that message is. The rose soon drips and dies, the briar fades away, but my fond heart for you I love shall never go astray. Now Alsop had worked as a labourer in the English Midlands. His work was poorly paid, irregular, was barely enough to make a living. In 1833, he was convicted for stealing sheep in Staffordshire. And just a year later, he boarded a sailing ship rather like this one for that long and perilous voyage out to Australia. He was 21 years of age and he would never, ever see his mother again. Thomas Allsop was one of a generation of exiles, white Australia's convict settlers. From 1788, when the first fleet made landfall in Sydney, to the mid 19th century, when transportation finally ended, over 160,000 convicts from all over Britain were imprisoned in Australia. Why so many convicts? And how did they end up in Australia, a distant land on the other side of the globe, a place only just apparent in the European imagination. In this book, there's a sketch of William Hogarth's London. It depicts a society falling apart at the seams. Poverty, unemployment, immorality, and all kinds of crime are all too evident. It was completed in 1751, not so very long before British authorities decided to exile felons to Australia. Britain had been torn asunder by the Industrial Revolution. Within a matter of decades, thousands had been cleared, uprooted from their traditional lives in the countryside and crowded as slum labour into the cities. The population soared, the prisons overflowed, and that gap between the atrociously poor and the obscenely rich grew greater and greater. Up until the late 18th century, men like Alsop might well have been sent off to the Americas. The settlers there needed cheap convict labour. And Britain, Britain was all too keen to get rid of that surplus population of felons. But the American Revolution changed all of that. And that's telling you something very important about Australian history. There's really nothing new about globalisation. From the moment of its first foundation, Australia was conceived within an international context. That battle on Bunker Hill led directly to the founding of a new society. Thomas Alsop may not have had a very deep understanding of the global politics, international intrigue and greedy grab for territory that lay behind transportation. But it is fair to say that he harboured a sense of injustice. Some historians have read coins like his as an act of protest. To etch that poignant farewell to his mother, Allsop and whoever may have helped him first scratched away the face of the sovereign, bearing a smooth surface for that neat, cursive hand. It may have been political, but it was certainly very practical. Simple and cheap, 
durable and light. This defaced coin could be carried virtually anywhere by its owner. This coin could be your constant companion. Immensely practical and also enduringly emotional. Coins like this were called love tokens. Often they were pressed into a loved one's hand in that final moment of parting. And Thomas Allsop's message still speaks to us across the ages. A gesture of remembrance, reuniting a mother and a son, divided by over 12,000 miles of ocean. So, what was life like for Thomas Allsop and the tens of thousands of other convicts who came out to Australia? We're standing in front of Hyde Park Barracks in Sydney. This was a kind of prison come dormitory where convicts were first held on their arrival in the colony. It's from here that the chain gangs went out to work. Men bludgeoned into labouring, toiling in their shackles, work as a grisly form of punishment. Convict Australia was a society based ultimately on terror. Those who wouldn't work were flogged here in this very courtyard. Those who challenged authority were beaten senseless. And for those who continued to resist or abscond or simply to misbehave, there was a whole apparatus of what was called secondary punishment. Exiled to Australia, a recalcitrant convict could find himself exiled again to prison camps in the isolated outposts of Van Diemen's Land or Norfolk Island. And you know, for much of the time, that Australian history has been written. That compelling caricature of convict society as a slave society has denied men like Thomas Allsop their individuality, their agency. In the last 40 years, there's been something of a revolution in the way that Australian historians view the convict experience. We used to see convict society as a form of slavery, not much different to the plantation economies of the southern states of America. Today, we're also mindful that for many, Australia was a land of freedom, of opportunity. So let's think about that. And let's see how this museum changes our view of convict Australia. Look at this amazing depiction of early Sydney. It doesn't show a series of prison cells. There was no need for a cell when the whole island continent was a prison. For the most part, convicts were assigned to free settlers and allowed to wander the length and breadth of the township. As the colony developed, they found themselves better fed, better housed, better clothed, and far more likely to improve their lot than that in starving class-bound Britain. And a man with skill even just a builder's labourer like Thomas Allsop had a tremendous advantage. A slave is usually born into slavery, as is his or her children. Convicts like Thomas Allsop, by contrast, saw themselves as free-born English men and women. One day, one day their sentence would expire. They'd be set free, and many could hope to own their own cattle, own their own land, something unimaginable for the poor of urban England. These were men and women who had a sense of their own value. Every convict knew the rations and the condition he or she was entitled to. When a master failed to provide these, the convict didn't hesitate to petition the governor. They nurtured what historians have called a moral economy, a sense of what is fair and just and reasonable. Australians today might call them stroppy. And convicts were acutely aware that they were really the only viable labour force in the colony. So from almost the day they arrived here, convict settlers organised. They organised individually and collectively to improve their conditions. Listen, you can almost hear them whispering to one another now. What can we get away with tomorrow? What better deal can we possibly get? Masters too. Masters realised it was much more efficient to give a man incentives than to punish him. An extra bag of flour, a raw ration of rum, indulgences great and small powered Australia's convict economy. When Thomas finally gains his freedom, he takes to hawking fish here by the wharves of Hobart. He also takes a wife 
Sarah Eliza Kirk, a convict from Ireland, 15 years his junior. They raised two children, a son Thomas and a daughter Sarah, and they lay the future of the colony. Instead of thinking of Thomas Allsop as a slave or an exile, let's see him rather as a settler. And when you think about it, he was the ideal settler for a place such as this. The men and women who came here were relatively young, reasonably fit to survive the rigours of the voyage, and a very high proportionate were literate. And even Thomas Allsop, a man of very few written words, had that eloquent message made for his mother. Convicts brought with them the skills that were needed to build a new society. They cleared the land, they bridged the rivers, and they laid out the towns. And here in Hobart, where Thomas Olsop ends up, they planted pretty Georgian cottages on a new and unfamiliar landscape. And this was to be a reproductive as well as productive force. Through marriage to convict and free man alike, through all manner of complex sexual transactions, Female convicts mothered the nation, their domestic skills as essential as Thomas Allsop's to the survival and the growth of the colony. So, what has Convict Australia left us? Much more than a handful of damaged coins, though that, as we've seen, is really something of a treasure. Many Australians attribute their strong sense of justice to the injustice all too evident through so much of our early history. A sympathy for the underdog, a suspicion of authority and a willingness to assert one's worth and bargain and organise. Perhaps we owe all of that, a lot of that, to our roots in convict Australia. For Australians of Irish descent, and around a quarter of the men and women transported to Australia were Irish, a convict heritage fuses with a much larger legacy of Irish republicanism and the struggle against British colonialism. And you know, we should remember that hundreds of convicts transported to these shores from Ireland and elsewhere were in fact political prisoners. They were radicals. They were trade unionists. They were men and women who rallied against the inequality of an old world and who hoped to build a better one in the new. But we also need to be careful not to replace one caricature of convict Australia with another. The truth of it is, convicts were a diverse and complex cohort. They were villains as well as victims, accomplished artisans and rude, unskilled labourers. There were those who thrived in a new society and those who languished. Most importantly of all, perhaps, is that convicts were complicit, willingly and unwillingly, in the whole project of colonialism. They were in the front line of the white invasion of Aboriginal country. Ironically, the dispossessed played their own grim part in the work of dispossession. And yet none of that diminishes the eloquence of Thomas Allsop's humble love token. In this tiny object, we can still hear his voice, a voice seldom heard in an archival record that usually privileges those with power and with authority. And the themes Thomas alerts us to of separation and exile, anguish and incarceration, tenderness and hope, we'll encounter again as we explore Australia. If you'd like to learn more about the issues raised in this episode, why not catch Susan Carland in conversation? This time, Susan's talking to historian Ray Francis in the remains of the female convict factory in Hobart. <laughs>